All right. Can anybody give me a thumbs up or a yay in the chat if they see, can see my screen? This is synthesis. Thanks a lot, Erica. Thank you. I really appreciate that. All right, great. So here we go. Organic chemistry two. This is chemistry 3111. So all of you have finished chemistry, eh, chemistry 3101. Right? What are the major concepts you would have learned from that class? You would have learned SN1, SN2, E1, E2. Then after that, you would have done a whole chapter on alkenes, the alkenes. Then you would have done a whole chapter on alkynes, alkynes. And those are the concepts that are covered in chapter 11. Now, of course, you also covered things like IR, NMS, NMR right? Spectroscopy and spectrometry. Um, you also would have covered things like stereochemistry, acid-base chemistry. So, so many important concepts are covered in organic chemistry one, but we're going to be exploring these three concepts mainly in chapter 11. So, if you're wondering, you know, what chapters would those be in the book? Those would be chapters seven, eight, and nine, and then a little bit of chapter 10. We'll put here a little bit of radical chemistry as well. Not a ton, but there's a little bit in there. So again, if you need to review, it would be chapter seven, eight, nine, and 10 are the main chapters that are going to be explored in chapter 11. So let's take a look. One-step synthesis. One-step synthesis is just a politically correct way of saying the reagents or the reactions that you would have learned in organic chemistry one. So Solving a synthesis problem or providing the reagents is straightforward when you only need one reaction. Well, here we have a compound. This is called isobutylene. So isobutylene, and that's a common name for the compound. Of course, the longest carbon chain has three carbons. You'd call this propene. So you could call this um, uh, two-methylpropene. That would be another uh, name for this compound, but isobutylene is the common name. And so this compound has an alkene in it. And we know that if we want to put a bromine on each of the sp2 hybridized carbons, what do we need for that? We just need some bromine, Br2. And of course, it proceeds through the bromonium ion, which you would have learned about in chapter eight in the alkenes chapter. Now here we don't, I didn't put a solvent yet, but you could put a solvent if you wanted to, something like dichloromethane is a good solvent for bromination. Not required, it's not required to put a solvent in, but you could. And if you've had me as an instructor before, you're probably familiar with me putting little stars like this, which usually means you have to know the mechanism of this reaction. And so I would expect you to know the mechanism of bromination. So um, the only way that you can, you know, master multi-synthesis, uh, multi-step synthesis problems is to master all of the reactions, okay? And these are the words of the author of our textbook, David Klein, who is one of the most respected organic chemistry teachers in this on this planet, really. And so let's start out by reviewing some of the reactions that we would have learned in chapter eight. So we're gonna talk about things like Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov, hydrohalogenation, halohydrin formation, et cetera, ozonolysis, all those terms, okay? If they're all coming back to you, but before we get into those, why don't we tackle this reaction first, okay? The first reaction that we'll do together in this class is if we take this compound, this is methylcyclohexane, and if we want to convert that into one bromo, one methylcyclohexane, could anybody tell me what would the reagents be that I would use for that reaction? And don't be shy, we're learning the subject. Think you have an idea, type it in the chat or holler it out. How would I do this reaction here? So th remember, this is we're just adding bromine to an alkane, right? We're starting it with an alkane, and then we want to um, make a halo alkane or an alkyl halide. So it's not going to be HBr, okay? Exactly. It's going to be bromine. It's going to be bromine plus lighter heat. Okay, I'm going to put H nu. Uh, I would accept heat as well. Uh, absolutely. However, the textbook likes to use light a lot of the time. So there you go. So this would be a chapter 10 reaction, radical bromination. So this is a reaction from, eh, from chapter 10. Okay. But I promise the rest of them are from chapter eight uh, for the most part. 
okay? So let's try the next reaction. Let's try this one here. If I have this tertiary alkyl halide, right? The reason we call this tertiary is because this carbon that I have in blue is connected to one, two, three carbon. So this is a tertiary alkyl halide. And I want to convert it to one methyl cyclohexene. So one methyl cyclohexene, this compound right here. Now for that, I'm going to need a base. Would I use a hindered base or an unhindered base to do this reaction? Can anybody tell me that? An unhindered base. Thanks, Mustafa. Absolutely. It's going to be an unhindered base. I'll chose what you put down, which is sodium ethoxide. Yes. Let's do that. So Mustafa chose that because he said, well, that's going to abstract this proton in red, and it's going to give me the um, Zaitsev alkene. Now, it's not written on here, but what if we wanted to make the Hoffman alkene? What if we wanted to make this compound? Okay, so in that case, we'd have to pull off this blue proton that I have here. Could anybody tell me what kind of base I would use to do, to do that transformation? Yeah, thanks, Raul. Absolutely. I would use potassium T-butoxide. Yep, can't argue with that. Right, so remember, this would be called the Hoffman, the Hoffman alkene. And then this one down here, I don't have a lot of space, but that would be the Zaitsev alkene. Okay, so I won't write the word Zaitsev in there. But there you go. So those two reactions, those would both be a chapter seven. So chapter seven, when we talked about elimination, all right, now I promise the rest of it is going to be chapter eight chemistry. Okay, so let's take a look at this reaction here. Okay, I have an alkene and I'm adding HBr to it. Could anybody tell me what I have in this red oval? Am I adding the HBr in a Markovnikov or an anti-Markovnikov fashion in this case? Anybody have an idea with this? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, you guys are great. It's an anti-Markovnikov, can't argue with that. So I'm gonna scribble in here, HBr, and then for anti-Markovnikov, of course, we need a peroxide. Now this is a reaction we learned in chapter eight, and then we investigated the mechanism in more detail in chapter 10, right? So we covered it in two chapters. Now, if I wanna do a Markovnikov addition of HBr, all I need is just plain old HBr, Right, and I would expect you to know the mechanism of that reaction, okay? How do you draw the mechanism of Markovnikov addition? So again, this is Markovnikov addition of HBr across a double bond. All right, let's try this one down here. So we're kind of going backwards here. We're going down here to um, creating an alcohol. Now this is a Markovnikov addition of, um, a Markovnikov addition of um, water across the double bond. So what would be the best conditions for that? Well, what I would choose would be H3O plus, okay? H3O plus. Now you could use oxymercuration, demercuration for this. So this is not really gonna be used on here, but you could use um, oxymercuration, demercuration conditions. So mercuric acetate and water followed by sodium borohydride. But does anybody remember why you would use these conditions? Why would you bring bust out mercury to do a reaction like that? Could anybody tell me why? There's a good reason for it. Prevent rearrangement. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Avoid. Kristen, is that you? Yeah. Awesome. So avoid carbocation rearrangement. Exactly. So you would do that to avoid a carbocation rearrangement. Well, the next one is going to be an anti-Markovnikov addition of water across a double bond. So for that, it's a two-step process. We use borane and THF, followed by hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide in no particular order, okay? I think the book usually puts sodium hydroxide first. And remember, this is a syn addition. Syn addition, where the hydrogen and the hydroxyl are added to the same face of the molecule. However, we don't follow the axiom the rich get richer. The hydroxyl group goes on the carbon that has more hydrogens on it. Okay, next one. If we want to do a hydrogenation and just reduce the entire molecule right back to whence it came, right? So for that, we would use hydrogen and platinum, palladium or nickel. Either one is fine. I'm going to do the next one too, which is just bromination. And remember that bromination is anti-addition anti-addition. So in this case, we would end up with the compound that's shown here, plus it's an antimer. 
Um, the next one, this is a halohydrin formation. I know you guys probably remember this better than I do, but can anybody tell me what the conditions are for this reaction? So this one, we're going to use bromine. Okay, we need our bromine, our Br2, but we need water as our solvent. Okay, so this, thank you, exactly. So this is called halohydrin formation, okay? And so remember that the hydroxyl goes on the more substituted carbon, which might seem counterintuitive, but we did go over the rationale as to why that is. It's because the partial positive charge passes through the most substituted carbon, um, the next one is an anti-dihydroxylation. I'll just do this one for you. So the first step is going to be RCO3H or MCPBA. MCPBA. So MCPBA is just a type of peroxy acid. So I don't have a lot of space on here. But MCPBA is this compound. So if I just draw the, the quick Lewis structure, it looks like this. So you can see that it has the RCO3H already in, in it, okay? So this is MCPBA. And so the first step is gonna be MCPBA, and that forms an epoxide. So you actually form this compound. So I'll draw it with, um, I'll just put, uh, I'll draw it the way it is. So you'd have the methyl group pointing up, and then you'd have an epoxide pointing down like this, and then in the second step, you treat it with H3O plus, and then it's going to break it apart, okay, to give you the trans diol. So that's an anti-addition. Um, what about syn addition? So this reaction here, for this one, the first step, and we learned several ways of doing this. We learned using um, uh, uh, potassium permanganate and sodium hydroxide at cold temperature. We talked about, um, I think, a two-step process using um, osmium tetroxide and sodium bisulfite. But the easiest way to do this is just in one step, and that is to use a catalytic amount of osmium tetroxide. So we'll put OSO4, catalytic amount. Does anybody remember the, um, the co-oxidant, the other reagent that you use with the catalytic amount of the OSO4? Anybody remember that one for this reaction here? Yeah, thanks, Kristen. It's NMO, n methylmorpholine n oxide, N M O, great. And then the last one, ozonolysis. Okay, so to do an ozonolysis on an alkene, the first step is going to be ozone, the second step is going to be DMS, or it can be zinc and water. Okay, either one is totally fine. And there you have it. So just a rehash, you know, what are mechanisms on here that I think you should be able to draw? I'd say that these, um, I'll use a green pen for these, okay? I'd, see these, I'd say these chapter seven mechanisms are ones that you should be able to draw, the E2 reactions. I'd say this one here, again, the Markovnikov addition is important. I'd say the second step of, you know, opening the epoxide is important. I'd say the bromination, going through the bromonium ion is important. And then finally, I'd say, um, Markovnikov addition of, of acid across a double bond is also important. So those are the mechanisms you'd want to know for chapter eight. What do you think? Give me a thumbs up. So good, uh, so far so good? Everybody good on their chapter eight chemistry? There's a lot of it. Okay, all right. Let's move on. Let's try some chapter nine chemistry. Okay, so chapter nine is all about alkynes. So anything to do with a triple bond and so let's go through all of these. Okay, there's some nuances in a couple of these, but if you look at this reaction and this reaction to give you the alkyne. So if you remember, when you have two bromines on the same carbon, that's called geminal. So we'd say these two bromines are geminal. And then we'd say when the two bromines are on opposite carbons or adjacent carbons, I guess, they'd be vicinal. This in all, okay. I don't know if you can even read my writing. Geminal. Anyhow, so to take 
the geminal dihalide and make the alkyne or the vicinal di um, dihalide and make the alkyne. It's the same conditions either way. Okay? It's the same exact same conditions either way. So the first step is going to be what? Excess. Does anybody remember the base? Heck yeah. All right. Thanks, Anna. All right. So excess sodium amide. You got both steps. Perfect. We'll throw them both in. Okay. Followed by water. So we'll put in the same thing here. So excess sodium amide. And then H2O. Great. As we say in Scottish. All right. The next one. If we just wanted to add HBr across the triple bond, for that, we would just write HBr. I would write one equivalent. That's just me. HBr, and I would put one equivalent. So they'd know that for every one mole of this, I use one mole of this. And then to um, to make the dihalide, I just use HBr like this. Anyhow, I don't know if you guys remember, we discussed termolecular mechanisms. So I just showed you this quickly in organic one and said the mechanism for this reaction is not what you think it might be it, because you don't form a vinylic carbocation, it's really unstable. So we said it's a termolecular mechanism. So I would not expect you to know that mechanism. However, I would expect you to be able to draw this one and this one, okay? The double elimination followed by protonation. Uh, let's see, what should we try next? Let's try this one. What if you want to do a Markovnikov addition of H2O across a triple bond? So we need sulfuric acid and water, but there's one other reagent we need for this. So I'm going to put in here uh, sulfuric acid and water. And there's one other thing. Yeah, thanks, Mustafa. Mercuric sulfate. Awesome. Yep. Mercury 2 sulfate. So that's a Markovnikov addition. And so what you would get in that case would be this enol. And then the enol undergoes tautomerization to give us the methyl ketone. Okay, so this is Markovnikov addition. Now the next one is anti-Markovnikov addition. So the first step is going to be 9-BBN. Okay, and the second step is going to be sodium hydroxide and, um, and uh, hydrogen peroxide. I'll write it in the same order I had it in the previous slide. So H2O2 and sodium hydroxide. Now that's anti-Markovnikov. So that would give you this enol. And that enol is going to undergo tautomerization to give you um, an aldehyde, okay? So a methyl ketone and an aldehyde. And again, this is anti-Markovnikov. Anti All right, next reaction, one of the most important reactions we learned in organic chemistry one because it enables us to increase the number of carbons in our carbon skeleton. So we're going from three carbons to four carbons. And so that first involves a deprotonation so we're going to use sodium amide for the deprotonation. NaNH2, which is a very strong base. That would give us the alkanide, right? That would give us this alkanide, which is going to be a strong base, but it's going to be a good nucleophile too. So what would our electrophile be in this case? What would step two be? Yeah, thanks a lot, Kristen. Methyl iodide, I love it, perfect. Okay, now I don't, these are kind of falling off the edge of my iPad screen, but anyhow, the first one, if you wanna make the cis alkene, you would use hydrogen and Lindlar's, Lindlar's catalyst. The next one, you would just use the old conditions of hydrogen, palladium, platinum, or nickel. And then if you wanna make a trans alkene, for that you use um, sodium, and liquid ammonia. Okay, and remember this one passes through the radical anion. Radical anion. Intermediate, and that's why we end up with the trans compound. All right, if we want to add um, bromine across the triple bond, for that we just use, I'll use a different color here. For that we just use bromine, and then I would put here one equivalent, but again, that's just me. And then for the last one, I would write excess excess bromine and that just brominates the heck out of everything all right is it just me and jerry or is that a lot of reactions that's a lot of reactions okay so again this is chapter 
nine. Which mechanisms? So the ones that I highlighted are, oh, I forgot a reaction, didn't I? Ozonolysis. So let's scribble this one here. So step one is ozone. Step two, anybody? Ozonolysis of an alkyne. Water. Thanks a lot, you guys. Great. Awesome. There you go. So that's all the reactions that we covered in chapter nine. Again, mechanisms that I think are important. I say think are important. Um, I guess the, just the ones that I have with the green stars by already. And I'd say that the mechanisms of tautomerization. So from the enol to the methyl ketone or from the enol to the aldehyde, those are important mechanisms as well. All righty. So now that we have all that in mind, you know, now we can use these as tools to do all kinds of cool reactions. So a two step synthesis like this one here, you can see we have to take this secondary alkyl halide. We have a secondary alkyl halide. Let me use a blue pen here instead. So secondary alkyl halide. And there's two possibilities, aren't there? We could remove the blue proton or we could remove the red proton, but we want to remove the red proton, which is the more um, the more hindered proton. And so for that, we're gonna use an unhindered base. So we'd use something like sodium ethoxide, right? And I'd expect you to be able to draw that mechanism. You know, you should be able to draw the ethoxide ion like this, and you should be able to draw the proton transfer formation of the double bond loss of leaving group. You form the Zaitsev alkene. And then the second step, how would you describe this? Well, this is a Markovnikov addition, right? This carbon is richer in hydrogens, and now it's getting an extra hydrogen. And so for that, it would just be the addition of HBr. So there you go. These are the kind of you know transformations that you are expected to be able to do. So you can see those um, in the red circles that you see on the top here. But let's say you made a mistake in the first step and you wanted to go back to your starting material, you could use an anti-Markovnikov addition. So anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr to take you right back to where you were. Um, you could abst abstract that blue proton using potassium T-butoxide. So if you were to draw the T-butoxide ion, you would abstract the proton, form the double bond, lose the leaving group. This curved arrow looks a little wonky, doesn't it? Anyhow. There you go. All right, something like that. Um, and then of course, the anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr using peroxides, which again is covered, learned in chapter eight, but covered in more detail in chapter 10. Okay, now what if you have a hydroxyl as a leaving group? If I was to just zoom in on the hydroxyl like that, would you guys say that hydroxyl is a good leaving group or a poor leaving group? It's a poor leaving group. It's the worst of the leaving groups, isn't it? We're talking so terrible, right? What makes a good leaving group, okay? So good leaving group, let's remind ourselves, good leaving group is the conjugate base of a strong acid. So if you were to lose hydro, this just a hydroxyl the way it is, okay? The reason that this, and don't write this down, it's a heresy. The reason this is a poor leaving group is because hydroxide is the conjugate base of H2O. Is H2O a strong acid? No. So hydroxide is a crappy leaving group, okay? But what if we convert it into a tosylate, okay? If we treat it with tosyl chloride and pyridine, then we convert it into a tosylate. And a tosylate, which you might not remember, but it is the conjugate base of toluene sulfonyl toluene sulfonic acid, which is this guy here, okay? So we'll just write it, um, the tosylate would be this, okay? Which is the conjugate base of this acid, okay? Which is a strong acid. Oh, I think I forgot an oxygen in there. Anyhow, uh, but anyhow, the bottom line is you convert it into a good leaving group like that. So once you've converted it into the tosylate, you can treat it with a base. Um, you can to make the to make the sites of alkene. You can hydrate it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so again, you see how you've really got to master all of these reactions in order to um, in order to be able to move forward in the class. I just want to share one more or one quick reaction on here with you in case you've forgotten 
when to use oxymercuration, demercuration. Why do we have to use it in this reaction that I have highlighted in green? Maybe I'll just use my, my green pen, okay? So let's imagine, I'll just draw it down here at the bottom. Let's imagine you were to take this secondary alcohol, okay? And then you try, or sorry, shoot. Let's say you tried to take this alkene and you just treated it with H3O plus. Why is this not going to work? It's not going to give you this compound. Let's draw the mechanism and we'll find out why, right? So we're going to get a Markov Nikov addition of our proton. So we're going to end up with something that looks like this. So we end up with this secondary carbocation. But remember, there's a proton here. And so we're going to get a rearrangement, right? We're going to get a hydride shift so that we're going to end up with a tertiary carbocation. So we go from a secondary to a tertiary carbocation, and then after nucleophilic attack and proton transfer, so I'm not going to draw that entire sequence out because we don't have time or space, but I'm going to end up with this compound, okay? And you can see that compound is up here as well, but that is why you would have to use the oxymercuration, demercuration uh, conditions for this reaction that I have highlighted highlighted in green. So make sure you're always on the lookout for that. It's always a possibility. So with um, also with some of these strategies, we saw how to make a Zaitsev alkene and a Hoffman alkene. So if you wanted to, let's say, make the Zaitsev alkene, for that you would use an unhindered base like sodium methoxide. If you wanted to make the Hoffman alkene, you would use something like potassium T butoxide. If you wanted to do a Markovnikov addition, or sorry, anti-Markovnikov addition, sorry, Markovnikov addition, Mr. Dion's getting tired, you would use HBr. Um, so nothing really new on that slide. Um, so there you go. So this really talks about elimination. So we've covered that in detail. And so most of the reactions that are shown here were covered in um, chapters seven, eight, and nine, except for one of them, this reaction here. So one thing you can pretty much guarantee at this point in the class, whenever you're given an alkane, if you're given an alkane as your starting material, you know the first reaction is going to be to treat it with bromine and light. Okay, It has to be because there's nothing else you can do. Uh, but once you've converted it into an alkyl halide, then you can start doing different reactions with it. So with that in mind, let's see if we can tackle some of these reactions here. So the way that we would want to tackle these is, let's say we wanted to do this reaction here. We want to take this alkene and we want to convert it into an alkyne. The first thing we should always do is say, well, how many carbons do we have in our starting materials? We have six carbons here and then we have six carbons in our products. So there's no change to the carbon skeleton. Therefore, there's no ozonolysis occurring and there's no deprotonation of an alkyne or anything like that. Um, the next thing is, if there's no change in the carbon skeleton, if we do a quick retrosynthesis, the only way we know how to make this compound would be from the vicinal dihalide, right? And then to treat it with excess sodium amide. And so how do we make this compound from this compound? Well, the answer is just to treat it with bromine. So step one is going to be treated with bromine. Step two. It's going to be excess sodium amide. And step three is going to be to treat it with water to protonate it. So there you go. It's a three-step process to make this compound. Now, in the next one, we have a total of seven carbons in our starting material and seven carbons in the end, okay, in the final product. Well, similar to the last one, we have to, um, well, the last one we changed functional groups. This one, I guess we're just moving the halogen around. But we could do a retrosynthesis and say the only way we could make this compound, you know, based off of what we were starting with, would be to make this alkene and then to do a Markovnikov addition of HBr. So my question to you is, how do I get from here to here? How do I take this primary alkyl halide and make this alkene that I have drawn in blue? Could anybody tell me, would I use a hindered base or an unhindered base for this one? Anybody have an idea? Would it be hindered or unhindered? You'd want to use a hindered one, wouldn't you, Rachel? 
Right, absolutely. So you'd use something like t-butoxide because if you were to take the primary alkyl halide, this guy, and say, well, I want to abstract this proton, so I'll use sodium ethoxide, it's not going to happen. Okay, what's going to happen in this case is you're mostly going to get SN2. You're mostly going to get SN2 like that. And so to prevent that from happening, what you would have to use is a big old bulky hindered base. So you could use DBU, DBN, you could use potassium T-butoxide, whatever, but that's going to give you this alkene, right? The T-butoxide is gonna pull off this proton, okay? So um, it's gonna give you the alkene you want. And then the second step is going to be a Markovnikov addition of HBr. So there you go, a two-step synthesis. Does anybody have any ideas about C? So we have an exocyclic alkene, and then we want to make this internal alkene. Does anybody have an idea? Would I want to start with a Markovnikov addition of HBr in this reaction or an anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr? Heck yeah, it's going to be a Markovnikov, isn't it? Right, so let me just erase some of this spinach that I have on here. So let's write out the whole thing. If I was to take that compound, right, if I took this compound and I did a Markovnikov addition of HBr, it's going to give me this compound. Now, I have two possibilities. I could pull off the proton in red, and that's going to give me my starting material again, or I could pull off the proton in blue, and that's going to give me the desired product. Now, what base would I use to give pull off the proton in blue? Would I use a hindered base or an unhindered base? I would use an unhindered base. All right, so for this, I would use something like sodium methoxide, whereas down here, I would use something like DBU or potassium T-butoxide, something like that. So we have a two-step process. Our first step is going to be HBr for our Markovnikov addition, and our second step is going to be sodium. I'll put methoxide. If you put ethoxide, that's totally fine. Either one works. So for the last one, remember, if you're given an alkane, what's your first step going to be? The first step is going to be to treat it with bromine and light, like that. So that would give us this compound. And then we've seen this enough times already that we would use an unhindered base, like sodium ethoxide or methoxide, to give us the internal alkene. There you have it, folks. All right. So finished all those. So now changes to the carbon skeleton. Well, we didn't learn many ways to change the carbon skeleton in organic chemistry one, really only two possibilities. If we want to remove carbons, the only thing we really learned was ozonolysis. So if you see here, ozonolysis is a way to decrease the number of carbons. And then if we want to increase the number of carbons, well, we only learned one way to do that. And that was to take an alkanide. So remember, we call this an al and then to do an SN2 with that, so with some kind of primary alkyl halide, and that way we can increase the number of carbons. Now, in this class, 3111, we're going to learn a lot of ways to remove carbons, a lot of ways to add carbons, but so far, so far, this is all we have for adding the number of carbons is this reaction, and ozonolysis is the only way we have to decrease or remove carbons. So, with that in mind, Let's say we had acetylene. So this is acetylene, acetylene. And we want to make uh, this compound. So this would be what? Two pentine. Two pentine. Ah, Mr. Dion. Okay. So let's see here. What are we going to do? We're going to start with our acetylene molecule. And we're first going to treat that with anybody. What base would I use to start here? Yeah. Thanks, Anna. We're going to start with Na, NH2, and then in the second step, I've got to add an ethyl group on one side, 
and I've got to add a methyl group on the other side. Does it matter which one we add first? No. So let's do the methyl first. So we'll do methyl iodide first. So that would add the methyl group like that. Then we're going to treat it with sodium amide again. And then we're going to hit it with some ethyl iodide like this. And that's going to give us our product. I'm kind of running out of space here, but there you go. So that's going to be our final product. I remember doing this last one, B, with my students just a couple of weeks ago, if you were in that class. And, you know, some people were struggling with this one. But remember, in this class, it's the same thing as organic one. If you need a small compound that just has a few carbons, you can always imagine you have that as a reagent. So here we have a total of seven carbons, and then we need nine carbons overall, but we need to add the triple bond. So in that case, it's just a one-step reaction. You would just use sodium acetylide is the name of that compound, and that's just going to do the SN2 reaction and give you your final compound. So again, if you need something small like this compound, okay, or propyl acetylide or something like that, you can assume that you have it, okay? It's just a very inexpensive reagent. So there you go. Now we've looked at ways to increase the number of carbons in our skeleton. And so, you know, when you're faced with the synthesis problem in this class, you want to ask yourself, number one, is there a change to the carbon skeleton? Am I gaining or losing carbons? Well, the good news is at this point, if you're gaining carbons, you've got to have some kind of alkanide. And if you're losing carbons, it has to be ozonolysis. If it's a change in the functional group, that's trickier because you've learned a lot more reactions about um, you know, moving functional groups around. So in order to solve synthesis problems, it really recall, requires that you learn how to recall, recall all of the reactions that you've learned, okay? And you've got to work through many examples. I mean, organic chemistry, if there ever was a class where practice makes perfect, it's organic chemistry. So with that in mind, what I'd like to do is take a short break and give you guys a chance to tackle these three problems. So 11.7 A, D, and E. And then what we'll do is we'll come back and we'll try those. And then after that, we'll talk about retrosynthetic analysis for a couple more minutes. And then we'll try, um, I have a couple more synthesis problems that I want to look at you. But we're going to take a short break and then we're going to tackle 11.7 A, D, and E.